the days are gone when beauty bright my heart's chain wove when my dream of life from morn till night was love still love new hopes may bloom and days may come of milder calmer beam but there's nothing half so sweet in life as love's young dream. No, there's nothing half so sweet in life as love's young dream. Whether I shall turn out to be the hero of my own life, or whether that station will be held by anybody else, these pages must show. My earliest impressions are of my pretty young mother and of Peggotty, our servant and friend, and of our high-backed pew in church, and of the green grass of the churchyard where my father was buried. Sometime during this happy and peaceful period of my life, Peggotty and I went to Yarmouth to visit her brother. Upon our return, I found myself wild with excitement at the prospect of seeing my dear mother, but Peggotty, instead of sharing my joy, tried to check it, though very kindly, and appeared confused and out of sorts. I ought to have told you before, but I hadn't an opportunity. I should have made one, perhaps, but I couldn't exactly bring my mind to do it. What do you think, Master Davy? You have got a pa, a new one. I knew that she must mean Mr. Murdstone, a man with shallow, dark eyes who used to escort us home from church. I knew somehow, too, that our happy and comfortable home would now change. Mr. Murdstone, who had hitherto courted me, soon let me know how he would deal with me in the future. David, if I have an obstinate horse or dog to deal with, what do I do? I don't know. I beat him. I make him wince and smart. I say to myself, I'll conquer that fellow. And if it were to cost him all the beat he had, I should do it. There had been some talk of my going away to boarding school. Mr. Murdstone and Miss Murdstone, his sister who had come to live with us, had originated it, and my mother had, of course, consented. In the meantime, I learned lessons at home. They were very long, very numerous, very hard, perfectly unintelligible, some of them, to me, and I was generally as bewildered by them as I believe my poor mother was herself. Let me remember how it used to be and bring one morning back again. I come into the parlor after breakfast with my books and an exercise book and a slate. My mother is ready for me at her writing desk, but not half so ready as Mr. Murdstone or Miss Murdstone. I begin to feel the words I have been at infinite pains to get into my head all sliding away and going I don't know where. I hand the first book to my mother. Perhaps it is grammar or history or geography. I take one last drowning look at the page as I give it into her hand and start off aloud at a racing pace while I've got it fresh. I trip over a word. Mr. Murdstone looks up. I trip over another word. Miss Murdstone looks up. I redden, tumble over half a dozen words, and stop. Oh, Davy, Davy. Now, Clara, be firm with the boy. Don't say, oh, Davy, Davy. That's childish. He knows his lesson, or he does not know it. He does not know it. I'm really afraid he does not. Then you see, Clara, you must give him the book back and make him know it. Yes, certainly. That is what I intend to do, my dear Jane. Now, Davy, try once more, and don't be stupid. I obey the first clause of the injunction by trying once more, but I'm not so successful with the second, for I am very stupid. The despairing way in which my mother and I look at each other as I blunder on is truly melancholy. But the greatest effect in these miserable lessons is when my mother tries to give me the cue by the motion of her lips. Clara? Now, David, if I go into a cheesemonger's shop and buy 5,000 double Gloucester cheeses, fourpence, apenny each, present payment... I pour over these cheeses without result or enlightenment at the time when having made a mulatto of myself by getting the dirt of the slate into the pores of my skin, I am considered in disgrace for the rest of the evening. 
One morning when I went into the parlor with my books, I found my mother looking anxious, Miss Murdstone looking firm, and Mr. Murdstone with a long and limber cane which he poised and switched in the air. I tell you, Clara, I have been often flogged myself. Of course. To be sure. Uh, certainly, my dear Jane, but do you think it did Edward good? Do you think it did Edward harm, Clara? That's the point. <laughs> certainly, my dear Jane. Now, David, you must be far more careful today than usual. He gave the cane another switch and laid it down beside him with an impressive look. I felt the words of my lesson slipping off, not one by one or line by line, but by the entire page. I tried to lay hold of them, but they seemed, if I may so express it, to have put skates on and to skim away with a speed that had no checking. We began badly and went on worse. And when at last we came to the 5,000 cheeses, canes he made it that day, my mother burst out crying. <laughs> Well, my dear Jane, I think. No, Jane, we can't expect Clara to bear with perfect firmness the worry and torment that David has occasioned her today. David, you and I will go upstairs. Clara! Are you a perfect fool? I saw my mother stop her ears then, and I heard her crying. Mr. Murdstone walked me up to my room slowly and gravely. I am certain that he had a delight in that formal parade of executing justice. And when we got there, suddenly twisted my head under his arm. Mr. Murdstone, sir, pray don't beat me. I've tried so hard to learn, but I can't learn while you and Miss Murdstone are by. Oh, can't you, David? Well, we'll try that. He had my head as in a vice, but I twined round him somehow and stopped him for a moment, entreating him not to beat me. It was only a moment that I stopped him, for he cut me heavily an instant afterwards, and in the same instant I caught the hand with which he held me in my mouth between my teeth and bit it through. Ah! It sets my teeth on edge to think of it. He beat me then as if he would have beaten me to death. Above all the noise we made, I heard the stairs, and I heard my mother crying out. Then he was gone and the door was locked outside. And I was lying, fevered and hot, and torn and sore, and raging in my puny way upon the floor. For five days, I remained a prisoner in that room, attended by no one but Miss Murdstone. Finally, one night, I was awakened by hearing through the door my own name spoken in a whisper. Davy? Davy? Is that you, Peggy? Yes, my own precious. Be soft as a mouse, or the cat'll hear us. How's Mama, Peggy? Is she very angry with me? No, not very. What's going to be done with me, do you know? You're to be sent away to school, Davy, my darling, tomorrow morning. Can you hear me, Davy, dear? Yes. My own, this is what I want to say to you. Never forget me, for I'll never forget you. And I'll take care of your mama, Davy, as ever I took care of you. And I won't leave her. The day may come when she'll be glad to lay her poor head on her stupid, cross old Peggotty's arm again. And so I was sent away to school the next morning. And as punishment for my crime against Mr. Murdstone, for which I was most heartily ashamed, it was arranged that I should wear a sign on my back for all the world to see. Take care of him, he bites. I was not considered as being formally received into school, until J. Steerforth arrived. Before this boy, who was reputed to be a great scholar, and who was very good looking, and at least half a dozen years my senior, I was carried as before a magistrate. He inquired under a shed in the playground into the particulars of my punishment, and was pleased to express his opinion that it was a jolly shame, for which I became bound to him ever afterwards. What money have you got, Copperfield? Seven shillings. You better give it to me to take care of, at least you can, if you like. You needn't, if you don't like. 
I hastened to comply with his friendly suggestion and opening my purse, turned it upside down into his hand. Do you want to spend anything now? Oh, no, thank you. You can if you like, you know. Say the word. No, thank you, sir. <laughs> Perhaps you'd like to spend a couple of shillings or so in a bottle of currant wine by and by. Up in the bedroom? You belong to my room, I find. Well, yes, I think I would like that. <laughs> and another couple of shillings or so in biscuits and another in fruit, eh? I say, young Copperfield, you're going it. I smiled because he smiled, but I was a little worried in my mind, too. Well, we must make it stretch as far as we can, that's all. I'll do the best in my power for you. I can go out when I like, and I'll smuggle the prog in. With these words, he put the money in his pocket and kindly told me not to make myself uneasy. He should take care. It should be all right. He was as good as his word, if that were all right, which I had a secret misgiving was all wrong, for I feared it would be a waste of my mother's two half crowns. When we went upstairs to bed, he produced the whole seven shillings worth and laid it on my bed in the moonlight, saying, There you are, young Copperfield, and a royal spread you've got. I couldn't think of doing the honors of the feast at my time of life while he was by. My hand shook at the very thought of it. I begged him to do me the favor of presiding, and my request being seconded by the other boys who were in that room, he acceded to it and sat upon my pillow, handing round the viands in perfect fairness, I must say, and dispensing the currant wine in a little glass, which was his own property. As to me, I sat on his left hand, and the rest were grouped around us on the nearest beds and on the floor. How well I recollect our sitting there, talking in whispers, or their talking and my respectfully listening, I ought rather to say, the moonlight falling a little way into the room, painting a pale window on the floor. The greater part of the guests had gone to bed as soon as the eating and drinking were over, and we, who had remained whispering and listening, half undressed, at last betook ourselves to bed, too. Well, good night, young Copperfield. I'll take care of you. You're very kind. I'm very obliged to you. You haven't got a sister, have you? No. That's a pity. If you had had one, I should think she would have been a pretty little bright-eyed sort of girl. I should have liked to know her. Well, good night, young Copperfield. Good night, sir. I thought of him very much after I went to bed and raised myself, I recollect, to look at him where he lay in the moonlight with his handsome face turned up and his head reclining easily on his arm. He was a person of great power in my eyes. That was, of course, the reason of my mind running on him. No veiled future dimly glanced upon him in the moonbeams. There was no shadowy picture of his footsteps in the garden I dreamed of walking in all night. This bottle's the son of our table whose beams are rosy wine. This bottle's the son of our table whose beams are rosy wine. Rosy wine! This bottle's the son of our table whose beams are rosy wine. Feeling what a fine thing it was to have my own lodgings and wanting to give a housewarming party, I invited my dear friend Steerforth and two of his friends from Oxford to dine. One of Steerforth's friends was named Granger, the other Markham. They were both very gay and lively fellows. Granger something older than Steerforth, and Markham youthful looking, I should say not more than 20. I observed that the latter always referred to himself indefinitely as a man, and seldom or never in the first person singular. A man might get on very well here, Mr. Copperfield. <laughs> it's not a bad situation. Uh, the rooms are really quite commodious. I, I do hope you've brought your appetite. Oh, yes. Upon my honor, town seems to sharpen a man's appetite. A man is hungry all day long. A man is perpetually eating. <laughs> Being a little embarrassed at first and feeling much too young to preside, I made Steerforth take the head of the table when dinner was announced and seated myself opposite to him. <laughs> Everything was very good, and we did not spare the wine. And Steerforth exerted himself so brilliantly to make the thing pass off well that there was no pause in our festivities, and I abandoned myself to my own enjoyment. <laughs> I began by being singularly cheerful and lighthearted. All sorts of half-forgotten things to talk about came rushing into my mind and made me hold forth in the most unwanted manner. I laughed heartily at my own jokes and everybody else's, called Steerforth to order for not passing the wine, made several engagements to visit Oxford, 
announced that I meant to have a dinner party exactly like that once a week until further notice, and madly took so much snuff out of Granger's <laughs> box that I was obliged to go into the pantry and have a private fit of sneezing ten minutes long. I went on, but passing the wine faster and faster yet, and continually starting up for a corkscrew to open more wine long before any was needed. I proposed Steerforth's health. I said he was my dearest friend, the protector of my boyhood, and the companion of my prime. I said I owed him more obligation than I could ever repay, and held him in higher admiration than I could ever express. I broke my glass in going round the table to <laughs> shake hands with him, and I said in two words, Steerforth, you're the guiding star of my existence. <laughs> I went on by finding suddenly that somebody was in the middle of a song. Markham was the singer, and he sang, When, when the, the heart, heart of a man, man is depressed, depressed with care, care, the clouds are dispersed when a woman appears. Like the, the notes of a fiddle, fiddle she, she sweetly, sweetly, sweetly raises her charms <laughs> Somebody was smoking. We were all smoking. I was smoking and trying to suppress a rising tendency to shudder. Steerforth had made a speech about me in the course of which I'd been affected almost to tears. Somebody was leaning out my bedroom window, refreshing his forehead against the cool stones of the parapet and feeling the fresh air against his face. It was myself. I was addressing myself as Copperfield and saying, why did you try to smoke? You might have known you couldn't do it. Now somebody was unsteadily contemplating his features in the looking glass. That was I too. I had a pale appearance in the looking glass. My eyes had a vacant look to them and my hair, only my hair, nothing else, looked drunk. Somebody said to me, let us go to the theater, Copperfield. The theater? To be sure, the very thing. Come along. Oh, but they must excuse me if I saw everybody out first and turned the lamp off in case of fire. Owing to some confusion in the dark, the uh, door was gone. I was feeling for it in the window curtains when Steerforth, laughing, <laughs> took him and led me out. <laughs> we went downstairs, one behind another. Near the bottom, somebody fell and rolled down. Somebody else said it was Copperfield. I was angry at that false report until... Finding myself on my back in the passage, I began to think there might be some foundation for it. it. It was a very foggy night. Great rings round the lamps in the streets. Steerforth said, You're all right, Copperfield, are you not? I told him, Never bearer. <laughs> Shortly after this, we were very high up in a very hot theater, looking down into a large pit that seemed to me to smoke. The people with whom it was crammed were so indistinct. There was a great stage there, too, and there were people upon it talking about something or other, but not at all intelligibly. There was an abundance of bright lights, and there was music, and there were ladies down in the dress boxes, and I don't know what more. The whole building looked to me as if it were learning to swim. It conducted itself in such an unaccountable manner when I tried to steady it. On somebody's motion, we resolved to go downstairs to the dress boxes where the ladies were. And then I was being ushered into one of these boxes and found myself saying something and people about me crying silence to somebody and ladies casting indignant glances at me. And what? Yes, Agnes, my childhood friend, sitting just before me in the same box with a lady and gentleman beside her whom I didn't know. I see her face now better than I did then, I dare say, with its indelible look of regret and wonder fixed upon me. Agnes! Lord bless me, Agnes! Hush! Pray you disturb the company. Look at the stage. I tried on her injunction to fix it and to make something of what was going on there, but quite in vain. By and by, I turned to look at her again and saw her shrink into her corner and put her gloved hand to her forehead. Agnes, I'm afraid you are now well. Yes, yes, do not mind me, Trotwood. Listen, are you going away soon? Am I going away soon? Yes. I had a stupid intention of replying that I was going to wait to hand her downstairs. I suppose I expressed it somehow, for after looking at me attentively a little while, she appeared to understand and replied in a low tone, 
I know you will do as I ask you if I tell you I am very earnest in it. Go away now, Trotwood, for my sake, and ask your friends to take you home. She had so far improved me for the time that, though I was angry with her, I felt a little ashamed, and with a short, good eye, for which I meant good night, got up and went out. They followed, and I stepped at once out of the box door into my bedroom, where only Steerforth was with me, helping me to undress, and whom I was by turns telling that Agnes was my sister, and adjuring him to bring a corkscrew that I might open another bottle of wine. How somebody lying in my bed lay saying and doing all this over again at cross purposes in a feverish dream all night, the bed a rocking sea that was never still, how as that somebody slowly settled into myself did I begin to parch and feel as if the outer covering of my skin were a hard board, my tongue the bottom of an empty kettle, furred with long service and burning over a slow fire the palms of my hands, hot plates of metal which no ice could cool. But, oh, the agony of mind, the remorse, the shame I felt when I became conscious the next day, my horror of having committed a thousand offenses which I had forgotten and which nothing could expiate, and my disgust at the very sight of the room where the revel had been held, my racking head, the smell of smoke, the sight of glasses, the impossibility of going out or even getting up. Oh, what a day it was. And he that will this drink deny, down among the dead men, down among the dead men, dead down among the down, 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 down among the dead men, let him lie. The morning after my appalling dissipation, a messenger arrived with a letter from Agnes. I was in such a nervous state that I was fain to lay the letter down on my breakfast table and familiarize myself with the outside of it a little before I could resolve to break this. I found when I did open it that it was a very kind letter containing no reference to my condition at the theater. My dear Trotwood, I am staying at the house of Papa's agent, Mr. Waterbrook and Eli Place Hoburn. Will you come and see me today at any time you like to appoint? Yours affectionately, Agnes. It took me such a long time to compose a reply at all to my satisfaction that I don't know what the messenger could have thought unless he thought I was learning to write. After many attempts, I wrote, My dear Agnes, your letter is like you, and what could I say of it that would be higher praise than that? I will come at four o'clock. Affectionately and uh, sorrowfully, T.C. At four o'clock, I found Agnes alone in the Waterbrook's drawing room. She looked so quiet and good that I yielded to my self-reproach and shame and, in short, made a fool of myself. I cannot deny that I shed tears. To this hour, I'm undecided as to whether it was upon the whole the wisest thing I could have done or the most ridiculous. If it had been anyone else but you, Agnes, I should not have minded half so much, but that it should have been you who saw me. I almost wish I had been dead first. Sit down. Do not be unhappy, Trotwood. If you cannot confidently trust me, whom can you trust? Ah, Agnes, you are my good angel. If I were indeed, Trotwood, there is one thing I should set my heart on very much, on warning you against your bad angel. My dear Agnes, if you mean Steerforth... I do, Trotwood. Then, Agnes, you wrong him very much. He, my bad angel, or anyone's. He, anything but a guide and support and a friend to me. My dear Agnes, now, is it not unjust and unlike you to judge him from what you saw of me the other night? I do not judge him from what I saw of you the other night. From what, then? From many things. Trifles in themselves, but they do not seem to me to be so when they're put together. I'm certain that what I say is right when I caution you that you've made a dangerous friend. 
I am not so unreasonable as to expect that you will change any sentiment that has become a conviction to you. I only ask you, Trotwood, if ever you think of me, I mean, as often think of me, to think of what I've said, do you forgive me for all of this? I will forgive you, Agnes, when you come to do Steerforth justice and to like him as well as I do. Not until then. And when will you forgive me the other night? When I recall it. You must not forget, you are always to tell me not only when you fall into trouble, but when you fall in love. Who is the lady this time? No one, Agnes. Someone. Trotwood? <laughs> no, upon my word. There is a lady, certainly, at Mrs. Steerforth's who is very clever, but I don't adore her. Ah, oh, Trotwood, I can always tell. I should keep a little register of your violent attachments, with the time, duration, and termination of each, like the table of the reigns of the kings and queens of England. <laughs> Trotwood? Yes, my dear Agnes. Have you seen Uriah Heep since you've been here? Uriah? No. Is he in London? Yes. I believe he's going to enter into partnership with Papa. What? Uriah? That mean, fawning fellow worm himself into such a promotion? Have you made no remonstrance about it, Agnes? You must not allow your father to take such a mad step. I'm afraid it's too late for that. Uriah had made himself indispensable to Papa. He'd mastered Papa's weaknesses, fostered them, and taken advantage of them until... until Papa is afraid of him. Let me earnestly entreat you, Trotwood, to be friendly to Uriah. Don't repel him. Don't resent what may be uncongenial to you and him. He may not deserve it, for we know no certain ill of him. In any case, think first of Papa and me. It was not very long after my conversation with Agnes that I encountered Uriah in the street. I was in no disposition for Uriah's company, but in remembrance of the entreaty Agnes had made to me, I asked him if he would come to my rooms and have some coffee. Oh, really, Master Copperfield? Oh, I beg your pardon, Mr. Copperfield, but the other comes so natural. I don't like you should put restraint upon yourself to ask an humble person like me to your house. <laughs> there is no constraint in the case. Will you come? Oh, yes. I led him to my place and heated the coffee while he professed so much emotion I could joyfully have scolded him. Oh, really, Master Copperfield? Oh, Master Copperfield, to see you waiting upon me is what I never could have expected. You've heard something, I dare say, about a change in my expectations, Master Copperfield? Oh, <laughs> I mean, Mr. Copperfield. Yes, uh, something. Who would have thought that I should be a partner in Mr. Wickfield's business? Oh, but the humblest of persons may be the instruments of good, Master Copperfield. And what a worthy person he is too, Master Copperfield. But uh, how imprudent he has been. I am sorry to hear it on all accounts. Oh, decidedly so, Master Copperfield. On all accounts. Miss Agnes, above all. So Mr. Wickfield, who is worth 500 of you, or me, has been imprudent, has he, Mr. Heap? Oh, but please call me Uriah. Oh, yes, truly, great imprudence. If anyone else had been in my place during the last few years, by this time he would have had Mr. Wickfield. Oh, and what a worthy man he is, Master Copperfield, too, under his thumb, under his thumb. I recollect well how indignantly my heart beat as I saw his crafty face preparing for something else. Mr. Copperfield, I've risen from my humble station since first you used to address me, it is true. But I am humble still. I hope I shall never be otherwise than humble. You will not think the worse of my humbleness if I make a little confidence to you, Master Copperfield, will you? Oh, no. Oh, thank you. Uh, Miss Agnes, Master Copperfield, you thought her looking very beautiful when last you saw her? I thought her looking as she always does. Superior in all respects to everyone around her. Oh, thank you. Oh, it's so true. Oh, thank you very much for that. Not at all. There is no reason why you should thank me. Why, that, Master Copperfield, is in fact the confidence I am going to take the liberty of reposing. Humble as I am, humble as my mother is, and lowly as our poor but honest roof has ever been, 
The image of Miss Agnes has been in my breast for years. Oh, Master Copperfield, with what pure affection do I love the ground my Agnes walks upon. I believe I had a delirious idea of seizing the red-hot poker out of the fire and running him through with it. I've not made my feelings known to anyone but you. You see, I'm only just emerging from my lowly station, and I count a good deal of hope upon her observing how useful I am to her father. Oh, she's so attached to her father, Master Copperfield, that I hope, on his account, she will come to be kind to me. I fathomed the depth of the rascal's whole scheme and understood why he had laid it bare. If you'll have the goodness to keep my secret, Master Copperfield, and not go against me, I shall count it as a particular favor. You wouldn't wish to make an unpleasantness or unbeknown go against me, rather, with my Agnes. Dear Agnes, was it possible that she was reserved to be the wife of such a wretch as this? There's no hurry at present, you know, Master Copperfield. My Agnes is very young still, so I shall have time gradually to make her familiar with my hopes. <gasps> Dear me, it's half past one. Because of the lateness of the hour, I felt obliged to give Uriah a bed for the night on the sofa before the fire, having lent him a nightcap, which he put on immediately and in which he made such an awful figure that I have never worn one since, I left him to his rest. I shall never forget that night. I never shall forget how I turned and tumbled, how I wearied myself thinking about Agnes and this creature. If I went to sleep, the image of Agnes with her tender eyes arose before me with an appealing face and filled me with vague terrors. The poker got into my dozing thoughts besides and wouldn't come out. I thought between sleeping and waking that it was still red hot and that I had snatched it out of the fire and run him through the body. I was so haunted by the idea that I stole into the next room to look at him. There I saw him lying on his back with his legs extending to I don't know where, gurglings taking place in his throat, stoppages in his nose, and his mouth open like a post office. He was so much worse reality than in my distempered fancy. When I saw him going downstairs early in the morning, I opened all the windows that my sitting room might be aired and purged of his presence. <sighs> Lovely flowers, I pray, my trust betray. Tell her she's my sole treasure, my delight beyond measure. Say, I say, or and or, her I adore. Lovely flowers, I pray, my trust betray. Tell her ah, how I languish, make her feel all my anguish. Tell her ah, once again my heart's sore pain. At the time of my conversation with Agnes, my heart was my own, but I soon fell over head and ears in love with Dora Spenlow, my employer's daughter. I lived principally on Dora and coffee. My appetite languished, and I was glad of it, for I felt as though it would have been an act of perfidy towards Dora to have a natural relish for my dinner. I bought four sumptuous waistcoats. Not for myself, I had no pride in them. For Dora. I took to wearing straw-colored kid gloves in the streets, and I laid the foundations of all the corns I've ever had. If the boots I wore at that period of my life could be produced and compared to the natural size of my feet, they would show what the state of my heart was in the most affecting manner. I took night walks to Norwood where she lived and perambulated round and round about the house and garden for hours together, romantically calling on the night to shield my Dora. I don't exactly know from what. Um, I suppose from fire, or perhaps from mice, to which she had a great objection. Now, Dora had a discreet friend comparatively stricken in years, almost of the right age of 20, I should say, whose name was Miss Mills. Dora called her Julia, and she was the bosom friend of Dora. 
happy Miss Mills. One day, Miss Mills said to me, Dora is coming to stay with me. She's coming the day after tomorrow. If you would like to come to call, I'm sure Papa would be happy with you. I passed three days in a luxury of wretchedness, and at last, arrayed for the purpose at a vast expense, I went to visit Dora at Miss Mills, fraught with a declaration. I was shown into a room upstairs where Dora and Miss Mills were. Dora's little dog, Jip, was there. Miss Mills was very glad to see me and was very sorry her papa was not at home, but I thought we all bore that with fortitude. Miss Mills was conversational for a few minutes, and then, laying down her pen, she got up and left the room. I began to think I would put off my declaration till tomorrow. I hope your poor horse was not tired at night when he got home from that picnic. It was a long way for him. I began to think I might do it today. It was a long way for him, for he had nothing to uphold him on the journey. Wasn't he fed, poor thing? I began to think I might put it off till tomorrow. Y yes, yes, he was well taken care of. I mean, he had not the unutterable happiness I had in being so near you. You didn't care for that happiness in the least when you were sitting by Miss Kit at the picnic. I saw now that I was in for it, and it must be done on the spot. Though I certainly don't know why you should care, or why you should call it a happiness at all. But of course, you don't mean what you say, and I'm sure no one doubts you're being at liberty to do whatever you like. <coughs> Jip, come here, you naughty boy. I don't know how I did it, but I did it in a moment. I intercepted Jip. I had Dora in my arms. I was full of eloquence. I never stopped for a word. I love you. I shall die without you. I idolize. I worship you. If you should like me to die for you, happen to say the word and I am ready. I have loved you to distraction day and night since I first set eyes upon you. I love you at this minute to distraction. I shall always love you every minute to distraction. <laughs> lovers have loved before and lovers will love again, but no lover has ever loved, might, could, would, or should ever love as I love you. The more I raved, the more Jip barked. Each of us, in his own way, got more mad every moment. Well, well, Dora and I were sitting on the sofa by and by, quiet enough, and Jip was lying in her lap, winking peacefully at me. It was off my mind. I was in a state of perfect rapture. Dora and I were engaged. Call me pet names, dearest, call me a bird that flies to thy breast at one cherishing word that folds its wild wings there, ne'er dreaming of night, that tenderly sings there in loving Shortly after this, my aunt astonished me by announcing that she was financially ruined and that my monthly stipends were a thing of the past. I remembered well the words of my dear old friend Wilkins Micawber, who knew more about financial difficulties than anyone I had ever known. A piece of advice. Annual income, 20 pounds. Annual expenditure, 19, 19 and 6. Result, happiness. Annual income, 20 pounds. Annual expenditure, 20 pounds, naught and six. Results, misery. The blossom is blighted. The leaf is withered. The god of day goes down upon the dreary scene. And in short, you're forever flawed. Thus, suddenly poor, but rather excited at the challenge I must face, I felt it necessary the next time I went to visit my darling to expatiate on my new condition. I soon carried desolation into the bosom of our joys by asking Dora without the smallest preparation if she could love a beggar. How can you ask me anything so foolish, Dodie? Love a beggar? Dora, my own dearest, I am a beggar. How can you be such a silly thing as to stand there telling such stories? <sighs> I'll make Jip bite you if you're so ridiculous. But I looked so serious that Dora looked scared and anxious and then began to cry. Oh, dear. Oh, I'm so frightened. Take me to Julia Mills. <laughs> I caressed her and implored her not to rend my heart. I told her how dearly I loved her. <gasps> 
how I, I felt it only right to offer to release her from her engagement because now I was poor. <laughs> How I could never bear it if I lost her. How I was already working with courage such as none but lovers knew to be practical. How a crust well earned was sweeter far than a feast inherited. Much more to the same purpose which I delivered in a burst of passionate eloquence quite surprising to myself. Dora, is your heart mine still? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, it's all yours. Don't, don't be dreadful. Don't talk about being poor and working hard don't my dearest don't. love the crust well earned but is i don't sweet want to hear any more about crusts and after we are married jip must have a mutton chop every day at 12 or he'll die <laughs> i was charmed with her childish winning way and I fondly explained that Jip should have his mutton chop with his accustomed regularity. But now, my own, may I mention something? Oh, please don't be practical, because it frightens me so. Oh, my sweet, there is nothing in all this to alarm you. I want you to think of our poverty quite differently. I want to nerve and inspire you. Oh, but that's so shocking. Do kiss Jip and be agreeable. <laughs> my soul... I was only going to mention that if you would look about you at your papa's housekeeping from time to time and endeavor to learn a little about accounts, for instance, oh. it would be so useful for us. And if you'll promise to read a little cookery book, which I will send oh. you, it would be so excellent for both of us. For our pathway in life is stony and rugged now. It rests with us to smooth it. We must fight our way onward. We must be brave. I was going on at a great rate, but it was quite unnecessary to proceed. I had said enough. I had done it again. Oh, dear. Oh, dear, I'm so frightened. Where is Julia Mills? Take me to Julia Mills and go away, please. I thought I had killed her this time. I sprinkled water on her face. I went down on my knees. I plucked at her hair. I besought her to look up. I implored her forgiveness. I ravaged Miss Mills' workbox for a smelling bottle and in my agony of mind applied an ivory needle case instead and dropped all the needles over Dora. I shook my fist at Jip, who was as frantic as myself, and was a long way beyond the end of my wits when Miss Mills came to my rescue and calmed all three of us down. When we had been engaged some half a year or so, Dora delighted me by asking me to give her that little cookery book I had spoken of and to show her how to keep housekeeping accounts, as I had promised I would. But the cookery book makes my head ache, and the figures make me cry. They won't add up. So I rubbed them out and drew little nosegays and likenesses of you, Dodie, and Jip all over the tablets. Time went on. And at last, here in this hand of mine, I held the wedding license. I doubt whether two young birds could have known less about housekeeping than I and my pretty Dora did. We had a servant, of course. She kept house for us. We had an awful time of it with Marianne. We felt our inexperience and were unable to help ourselves. We would have been at her mercy if she'd had any. She was the cause of our first little quarrel. My dearest life, do you think Marianne has any idea of time? Why, Dodie? My love, because it's five, and we were to have dined at four. Oh. My little wife came and sat on my knee to coax me to be quiet and drew a line with a pencil down the middle of my nose. <laughs> but I couldn't dine off that, though it was very agreeable. Don't you think, my dear, it would be better for you to remonstrate with Marianne? Oh, no, please, I couldn't, Dodie. Why not, my love? because I'm such a little goose, and she knows I am. <sighs> My <laughs> precious wife. We must be serious sometime. Uh, Give me the pencil. Now, let us talk sensibly. You know, my love, it is not exactly comfortable to have to go without one's dinner, now, is it? No. My sweet, how you tremble. Because I know you're going to scold me. My love, I'm only going to reason. But reasoning is worse than scolding. I didn't marry to be reasoned with. If you meant to reason with such a poor little thing as I am, you ought to have told me so, you cruel boy. Now, my own Dora, you are childish and are talking nonsense. 
You must remember, I am sure, that I was obliged to go out yesterday when dinner was half over, and that the day before that I was made quite unwell by being obliged to eat underdone veal in a hurry, and today I don't dine at all. I'm afraid to say how long we had to wait for breakfast this morning, and then the water didn't boil. And... I don't mean to reproach you, my dear. Not, not comfortable. I wonder, I do, what you are making such ungrateful speeches. When you know the other day, when you said you'd like a little bit of fish, I went out myself, miles and miles, and ordered it to surprise you. And it was very kind of you, my own darling. And I felt it so much, I wouldn't on any account have mentioned that you bought a salmon which was too much for two, or that it cost one pound six, which is more than we can afford. You enjoyed it very much. And you said I was a mouse. <sighs> and I'll say so again, a thousand times. I said it a thousand times and more. Everybody we had anything to do with seemed to cheat us. Our appearance in a shop was a signal for the damaged goods to be brought out immediately. If we bought a lobster, it was full of water. All our meat turned out tough, and there was hardly any crust to our loaves. And as to the washerwoman pawning our clothes and coming back in a state of penitent intoxication, I suppose that might have happened several times to anybody. <laughs> sorry for all this, Dodie. Will you call me a name I want you to call me? What is it, my dear? It's a stupid name. Child wife. When you're going to be angry with me, say to yourself, it's only my child wife. When I'm very disappointing, say, I knew a long time ago that she would make but a child wife. When you miss what you would like me to be, and what I should like to be, and what I think I never can be, say, still my foolish child wife loves me, for indeed I do. I invoke the innocent figure that I dearly loved to come out of the mists and shadows of the past and to turn its gentle head towards me once again and to bear witness that it was made happy, I answered. <laughs> 